Hello, everybody. Oh, man, I got a lady on the channel. I'm so happy she came on Strong Inspirations. I don't know what to do. I'm telling you, hold on, check it out. I couldn't sleep last night thinking about her coming on the channel. And, and so uh, I, I don't know how I found her. And then I did. And then I said, well, hey, just by chance, if you know any other people, she said, I know a few other people that you would, you know, would be good to interview. She said, I'm on the board of this. I'm on the board of that. I know all. That. I said, oh, man, I know I got a good one here. Everybody, you're going to be amazed at what she's going to tell us. Oh, I'm so excited. And so, uh, oh, but you know who I am. I'm Anthony Brogdon. I, I kind of forget who I am because I get like a little riled up. But I'm Anthony Brogdon. I'm the guy who find the people and I try to ask some intelligent questions. And so do me a favor, my brothers and my sisters, of you out there who are watching this channel, subscribe. It's free. Just hit the button. Like this video. If you don't like no other video you watch, you need to like this one because I'm telling you, I know she know what she's talking about. She look intelligent. <laughs> she got an intelligent look on her. Uh, hit the uh, hit the, uh, the, the the notifications bell because when the videos come up, you want to be first in line so you can run out there and tell everybody how smart you are. Hit the uh, no, hold on, don't hit no more buttons. Just tell somebody. Just tell somebody about strong inspirations. Don't keep it to yourself, please. The other things you know I want you to do, and this is on my own personal tip. If you don't know, I'm a filmmaker. I did this documentary called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. It's incredible information and this is 75 minutes long. It's going to blow you away. It's probably got, uh, I know I interviewed about 18, 19 people whose business uh, started, whose family business started in the early 1900s. You're going to love this film. I'm telling you, watch it. It's streaming on Amazon. It's called Business in the Black. And I took it to 40 cities on my own dime. I would show it in a church basement. It didn't matter. I wanted people to hear it. Then I wrote the book titled Black Business Book. It doesn't have the interviews, understand it, but it's got 204 facts that's going to blow your mind. I, 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 and I'm not no big reader per se, you know, I do read, but I like to get straight to the point. That's what my book does. I don't give you any commentary. I just give you the fact and let it stand on its own merit. And then I tell you where I found the fact. So I invite you to, to uh, order my book. And I, I, and when you order it, how about this? I give you an autograph. <laughs> that, that, that's going to mean something one day. I'm, trust me. You want to get your autograph copy of Black Business Book. And it's also available on Amazon, but you know, I'll tell you the truth, if you want to cut the big Amazon man out, you can just go directly to my website, which is businessintheblack.net. She's sitting there, she waiting, she said, come on, man, <laughs> quit talking, I'm ready to go. I got to tell her one more thing. And she yeah, like good. you're good. <laughs> How about this? How about this? You know, I use the word strong a lot, right? That's my, that's my brand word. Strong is everything I do. Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. I got a strong lady. She said, hey, let's go. Uh, come on. That's enough. Uh, introduce yourself. Let's get it on. Hi. Thanks so much for having me here, Anthony. Um, I'm Lindsay Barnard. I'm the director at the Ropey Museum, which is located in Ferrisburg, Vermont. And I've... Um, I've been doing research and studying the Underground Railroad and history of Quakerism for almost a decade now. Um, and my research specializes in uh, Quakerism. That was what my, my master's and PhD was in. Um, and I'm very lucky now to be at a historic site that combines all of my research interests. It's an yeah. Underground Railroad site. It's a national historic landmark. Yeah. Uh, for the, the work that the family did for the abolitionist movement, as well as for the Underground Railroad. Okay, let me stop you there right quick. I don't mean to get too personal. How you, are you from Vermont? How, who, who live in Vermont? <laughs> I'm not Vermont. from Vermont. I'm, I'm actually from central Pennsylvania, from Carlisle, okay. Pennsylvania. So I came up for the job. Now, Vermont is 
uh, the whole state is about what? How many people in Vermont? Do you know? Uh, it's very small, right? It is very small. Yes, uh, I believe there's less than a million in the state. Yeah. Well. Um, it is very tiny. It's one of the, the least populated states in the country, but it is absolutely beautiful. Oh, it's really? Beautiful and, and then, um, but it, but Vermont, and I, I've never been there. I got to ask you. Vermont is beautiful country because it's on the it's on the coastline, though, right? And you you know that. Yeah, we're we're inland, but we have the. Oh. I'm in the Champlain Valley region, so we have Lake Champlain is within 15 minutes of my house. Um, so you have beautiful water. You are close to the coast. You can get over to uh, Maine and into New England pretty easily. So oh. it is, a, it's a beautiful place with a lot of varied places you can go within driving distance. Oh, okay. And so I, I, have you always loved history? Is that, has that been your background? How did you, uh, you know, like it so much to, you know, de dedicate your life uh, and your career towards it? Yeah, I've always loved history. When I was an undergraduate, I was, I thought I was going to be a lawyer or a politician and I was a government major. And I was going to graduate early and said I didn't want to and became a history major as well. And I realized I just loved history so much. I wanted to pursue that path. So I went to grad school for um, history, thinking I was going to be an academic and got really involved in what we call public history, okay. and making history available to a much wider audience, um, whether it's at a historic site or through tours or museum exhibits, I got really interested in how we can make history relevant to people. And I started to take that route after graduate school. Oh, I love it. I love it. And so uh, have you, have you uh, un uncovered something that was uh, from a Black history perspective that was a ha-ha moment that happened in your town that no one else knew? Have, have, you, have you done something like that personally? Yeah, so the where I was living in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, I was working on a project called Community Heart and Soul. And the idea was you collect stories from your community to better understand people and culture and heritage. And we collected a story from a family called the Gumby family in a little tiny town called Mount Holly Springs, about 2000 people. And the, the Gumbies were a multi-generational African-American family they had lived there since just after the Civil War. They could trace their roots to around the late 1860s, 1870s. And they had been on the same piece of land since that time. And I collected their story. And as we started talking, I realized there was an entire African-American history in this tiny little town that nobody had collected. Nobody had deemed it important enough to incorporate into the town's history, into the community's history. Okay. And as we were talking, we found this incredible uh, AME Zion church that was sitting essentially in the Gumby's backyard. And yeah. their grandfather, who had been enslaved, he was a veteran of the Civil War, had helped to build this church. So they cared for it. They ensured that the legacy was there. And I got very heavily involved in that church oh. uh, and working with them to restore it, to bring to light this history. And that's oh. when I had this aha moment, this realization that these community stories exist everywhere and they're just waiting to be um, uncovered and shared. And it made me realize just how much we have not incorporated in the entire okay. narrative of American history, the Black it. story, and that let, we need to be doing that more. Let, let me ask you this now, uh, and maybe, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, I don't, you know, we're not doing this live, so, you know, it can be edited. Um, Slavery, they say, started in 1619 when they went to Georgetown. And then I later interviewed somebody and said that actually did stop some slaves before George, I mean, uh, Jamestown. Uh, but then there was slavery when the ships actually came up towards the East Coast before that. Isn't that correct? Yeah, and there had been forms of slavery for centuries. And you know, Indigenous people were enslaved prior to African slavery starting. Um, and I, there are points that you can point to where you do see slavery happening before Jamestown. But that ship coming in is symbolic of the first mass effort in Jamestown right. to import slaves for the intention of using African enslaved labor right. to start building the colonies. And then you start to see that race-based slavery, which is really what sets American slavery apart 
um, you know, using race as a justification to enslave. It, it, do, do they know when the first uh, Africans got to America, even before 1619? It, did that happen up in those colonies up in the East Coast, Vermont and New Hampshire, what have you? Is that what they, is that the little known secret? Yeah, Vermont was one of those places. It was always, it was a, you know, really back country. So in terms of when the first slave arrived in Vermont, I'm not entirely sure. There might sure. be somebody else who knows, but I'm not sure. Um, but it was, wasn't originally part of the English colonies. It had traded hands multiple times, but it was very much a, a backwoods type of colony. It hadn't okay. been industrialized wholly in the, even close to wholly in the 17th and uh, late 17th, early 18th century. What, what was Vermont a free territory or slave-owned territory back in the, in those days? Vermont did have slaves, and when in the 1790s, when the Vermont Constitution was created, they did a gradual emancipation. Um, Vermont has always had a very small population. Um, it had a very small population of African Americans in the 19th century. Less than one percent of the population in Vermont was African American, um, but they did a gradual. Ad uh, um, abolition here. Um, okay. And by the time you get to the Civil War, there were really no slaves in the state of Vermont. So, so can we assume almost that all of America uh, had slaves, all the states, you know, other than, you know, going out west before they discovered those territories. But then the northern areas and the east coast, they abolished it earlier than the ones in the south. And then they talked about seceding and all that. Is that is that the right assumption? Yeah, and part of that was due to, you know, there's the, there weren't large plantations being formed in the North, so you don't have large amounts of slave labor being used on the I farms, but we can point to instances where I'm from in Pennsylvania, for example, in Cumberland County, you have gradual abolition, but the way that the law was written it, into the 1830s, 1840s, when you expect all the Northern states are completely free, that's not the case. You, there are still some instances of, um, you know, one or two people who are enslaved, but, you know, are still within that kind of gradual I got you. period. Um, and so it's, you know, it's not quite as simple as, you know, north is free, south is enslaved. There's right. a lot of, you know, nuances within the law. I got you. Was, is there a port near Vermont that, that the slave ships would have come to, to dock? and then drop off them, uh, where would that have been? I think in Vermont, most of the um, slaves who would have been in the state would have been coming from, either been coming with people who were settling in Vermont in the 18th century. So they could be coming from New England states, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, um, but they would have been coming from elsewhere. Um, Boston and New York are two of the largest and nearest ports for, for Vermonters. When, 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 and then as you had mentioned about the, the, the that research you did, the, they, how, they came from where to, to, to escape and then end up in Vermont. Where did they come from? So we don't know the stories of everybody who came through at Rokeby. Uh, our museum focuses on two freedom seekers that we've been able to trace through documents, which is incredibly rare. Um, what we call our exhibit is free and safe. And once you arrived in Vermont, you were essentially free and safe from being captured and sent back to your owners in the South. So at Vermont, you didn't tend to hide. When you think of the Underground Railroad, you tend to think of it as you know, secretive locations and you're hiding. But once you get to Vermont, you don't really need to hide. Um, so Simon and Jesse are two freedom seekers that we uh, talk about in our exhibit. And Jesse, or um, Jesse, we know came from North Carolina, and we know that because um, Rowland uh, Thomas Robinson, who was an abolitionist, was writing to Jesse's owner in North Carolina to negotiate what it would cost to purchase his freedom. And Simon, we know, came from Maryland because we have a series of letters where they're talking about him getting from Maryland to Somerset County, Pennsylvania, and then eventually on to Vermont to the Robinsons' home at Rokeby. So it, we, we can trace a few people, but we don't know where everybody was coming yeah, from. Sure. We just know they were passing through Rokeby. Some might have stayed a night, some stayed longer. Simon and Jesse worked on the farm and earned wage and they went, moved on afterwards. Um, so we don't know, they could have been coming from all over the South. Yeah, sure. 
Now, when you when you, if a person got to Vermont, uh, and you and you you seem like you've passed a number of other states to get there that are free territories. Why can't you just let that be it? Do you have why? I mean, does why do you have to keep going <laughs> further? And then I understand they even went into Canada. Uh, what did the did the slave catchers go that far looking for people? No, so by the time you got to Vermont, you would be considered free and safe. Um, slave catchers wouldn't come this far north. Um, it would have been very difficult to get somebody back to Mason Dixon. Line That's what I would think, yeah. So you have a lot of, you think of people in, uh, well, where Simon was from, he was in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, which is very close to the Mason Dixon line. It's near Pittsburgh, it's close to Maryland, and yeah. it was deemed that he was not safe there. So he, he the, uh, several letters were going between abolitionists and the idea was to get him to Vermont. And ultimately he wanted to go to Canada, but they thought he would be better at least staying and earning a wage at the Robinson farm first. Um, so it, you, know, you don't wanna stay close to the Mason-Dixon line. We have lots and lots of reported instances of slave catchers going into Pennsylvania and capturing people or even kidnapping um, free African Americans right. and taking them back south. So people were trying to make it further and further north. And yeah. Vermont was kind of, it's the state between, you know, uh, you know, the next place to go is Canada. Um, you keep going north of Vermont and you're in Canada. Yeah. Um, and once you're in Canada, you are truly safe, but yes. you could have been safe in Vermont as well. Chances are no one was going to come and capture you there. Now, to get that far, uh, that's a lot of walking. And a lot of people don't understand how much walking you had to do, especially, uh, and it was good if you were enslaved in some of those border uh, states, you know, like the Maryland's and what have you, where if, if you could get so far and it wasn't far, but to get all the way to Vermont, how, how, how would that track have gone? I mean, uh, somehow they got on a horse and buggy or was that a lot of walking? Yeah, it, it was kind of a mixture. We know with Simon's story, um, Oliver Johnson was helping to coordinate his journey to Vermont. So he was working with the Griffith Farm in Somerset County, and they had Simon stay through the winter. And then Johnson actually shared with him a whole series of abolitionists on the route to get him to Philadelphia. So he had an idea of the places he was going to be stopping along the way. And then once he got to Philadelphia, presumably it was the same thing. There would be people helping him all along the way. Yeah, so he right. could be walking, he could be traveling with somebody. Um, we're not entirely sure because there were elements that were very secretive, especially um, once it becomes illegal to harbor freedom seekers and it becomes much more secretive. So you could be walking, you could be traveling by cart, but it's not an easy journey. And I often tell students when they're in the museum, and imagine, just how frightening it must be to putting your trust fully yeah. into somebody you've never met in the hopes that they're going to get you to the next location safely. Yeah. And it must just be a terrifying experience to go sure. days and days and days traveling, sure. fully trusting somebody you've never met before. When, 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 when like say, for example, in the, in the case of the gentleman you're speaking of, when he got to Vermont, uh, unless he went with other people, there weren't really many other African Americans, black people around him. So he had to integrate into the normal society as it was. Did, what, were they accepting of him? Did 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 he, or did he face uh, black versus white scenarios in the in the in the drinking fountains? And could he live a normal life there, uh, being yeah. so so much of it in the minority? Yeah. So I think that it. it being in a state where you are definitely in the minority yeah um you there's definitely forms of segregation in the 19th century i think it's it, it's difficult to to kind of separate culture and society of the 19th century and not see that there are even amongst people who were abolitionists or believed in abolition maybe not abolition right. themselves but they believed that um, enslaved people should be free there's still some level of prejudice amongst sure. some people, not sure. all, but there's some level of it. Um, and then being in a community where you might be one of only a handful of persons of color, you are going to stand out. Sure. Um, and that might be one of the many reasons why 
the population continued to stay around 1% or less in Vermont, people would move on to communities where they would feel less like they are standing out because of the color of their skin. There were some African American communities in Vermont. Um, some recent research looks at um, Hinesburg in Vermont and the black community that lived there. They had been farmers from really the late 18th century onwards. So we do know of some pockets of black communities in Vermont. Um, but we also know as more research is coming out, there were whole towns that were popping up on the Canadian side of the border um, in New York. Uh, and then you also have the growth of the cities. So people then once they are comfortable and settled and maybe earning a little bit of a wage, they're saving up money and going to New York City or to Boston and places where Philadelphia, where they can work and there's more readily available work. Um, that's the other thing with Vermont is Vermont in the middle of the 19th century is heavily agriculture, um, right. in particular with sheep. Um, by the 1840s, almost 80% of Vermont is clear cut and they have sheep grazing everywhere. Okay. And there's not, a, there's not going to be a ton of work for people coming through the states. So you're going to have a lot of people moving elsewhere to find work. Is there some uh, noted abolitionist from Vermont? Uh, like, I don't know where John Brown is from, but I mean, he came from Northern, you know, I guess East Coast territory. Is there somebody there or some, some a society of there that then was very proactive and, uh, and aggressive going into the South to helping educate uh, former slaves, things of that sort? So the Robinsons at Rokeby were leaders of the abolitionist movement in Vermont. Um, Rylan T. Robinson helped to found the Vermont Anti-Slavery Society. He was working very closely with all the kind of major abolitionists of the period. He was okay. regularly writing to William Lloyd Garrison. You can see Robinson's name popping up in the Liberator year after year after year. Um, he's working closely with Oliver Johnson, who's a close associate with um, Garrison, and he is really pushing for, you know, abolition to the point where you know, he splits with Quakers over the abolition movement because he believes in immediate em emancipation. They believe in putting their money where their morals are. So they okay. refuse to buy any goods that were, are supporting slavery in any way. And they would go without goods if they couldn't ensure that their sugar or their tea or the cotton for their clothing was not touched by slavery. Really? And he really pushed that philosophy. Um, he was writing in newspapers, trying to convince people. Um, he had a circulating library to try and convince people that you know, this was the only way to end enslavement is to really um, believe in the complete abolition of slavery. Um, and, and he even helped to organize um, a convention that brought Frederick Douglass into Ferrisburg. Okay. Where he gave okay. his speech during his New England tour. So the Robinsons were very instrumental in the abolitionist movement across the state of Vermont. Uh, is there a um, some noted conflict between those who were uh, like the Robinsons, very against slavery, and those who, who, even though they didn't have slavery in Vermont, still liked that institution and that attitude to where there were battles or skirmishes among them? Um, the There's such a thing as that? As far as I know with the Robinsons, they were among other Quakers in the region and other abolitionists who were wholly supportive of the work that they were doing. Okay. Okay. But there are lots of instances with people that they were working with in say New York City, where you do have a lot of pushback against the, the kind of immediate emancipation yeah, sure. uh, belief. Um, and then you know, there's, lots of different philosophies of how abolition should take place. Um, and you do see kind of not really arguments, but uh, kind of letter writing taking place within newspapers where they are refuting points from other people and their beliefs, um, trying to convince them that, you know, immediate abolition is the only way to go. Yeah. And um, they, the Robinsons were considered radical abolitionists. You have abolitionists and then you have these radical abolitionists okay. and okay. the Robinsons were among them. Okay. Uh, if, if you don't mind asking, and, and uh, maybe I, I don't know really well and, uh, and the viewers don't, what is Quakers? What does that mean? Is that a religion or yeah. what is that? 
Yeah, so Quakerism is a religion. It started in the 17th century after the English Civil War. So 1840s, 1850s, Quakerism arises. Um, and they become one of the major denominations um, in the uh, movement from England to the colonies. Right. So William Penn founds Pennsylvania and it starts out as a uh, free religious colony for Quakers and um, Baptists and uh, Germans um, who now that you think of the Amish and the Mennonites, um, okay. they, Pennsylvania was founded by a lot of those groups because William Penn was welcoming them into the states and Quakers were among them. And Quakers become one of the leading voices of abolition in the late 18th and then through the 19th century. Okay. They were one of the first religious groups to denounce slavery. They would refuse, they would actually kick people out of the religion if they continued to hold slaves. They were adamant that um, no member of Quakerism should ever hold um, or even at, in some meetings even participate in any way with slavery. No. Oh. Can, are there black Quakers? So there were some black Quakers um, in Philadelphia, okay. um, but it's not as dominant as say the Methodist church in the 19th century, okay. Okay. where you have um, both integrated uh, Methodist meetings and then later the creation of the African Methodist church. Okay. You tend to see uh, more African-Americans turning towards Methodism than you do Quakerism. Uh, besides the, uh, you know, what you have at your museum, are there, his, and I, I'm getting off Quakers, are there historical markers uh, that signifies uh, special moments in Black history in Vermont? Uh, uh, statues to anybody or, like I say, hi historical markers that say something? Yeah, so we have in Vermont the African American Heritage Trail, and okay. it's a mixture of markers, um, historic sites. In Rutland, they have a, a trail that focuses on African-American history. And uh, we have historic sites all across the state that are either tied to African-American history, Underground Railroad history. And a lot of those sites are open to the public for people to okay. stop and to visit. So you can always go to the Vermont African American Heritage Trail if you Google it, and you can see a list of all the places. That you yeah, can we're going to we're going to put all that in the description. Is there as we move up the timeline just a little bit for a couple more questions? Uh, and during the Civil Rights era, uh, where is Vermont in that? I mean, is there is there some uh, civil rights issues that happen in Vermont? that might make national acclaim or is it always kind of smooth sailing? How does that go? I am not sure, to be honest. That is so far outside what I know being, I got I'm you. brand I got new you. to Vermont. So I'm still learning a lot of Vermont's history. Um, I've, I just moved here in September. Um, so I'm not sure what Vermont's role was in terms of civil rights and the kind of the work that they were doing. I can say for, for Rokeby, by the time you get to the 1960s, the museum is just being created. So, and they're they're looking at you know the legacy of the Robinson family, um, right as the civil rights movement is kind of hitting its um, kind of high point in 1961-62. But right, the state you. as a whole, I'm not entirely sure. To yeah, know. yeah, sure. Uh, is there a is there a black neighborhood in Vermont or uh, in your city? where the, you know, a concentration of African-Americans live and is there a name for that neighborhood or something like that? So Vermont is still very, um, I'm not sure, I haven't seen the newest census records, but we're still not the most diverse state in the country. Um, I highly recommend if people are interested in the Black History of Vermont to look at um, Discovering Black Vermont by Elise Guyette. There was a black community in Hinesburg, which is very close to where we are in Ferrisburg. Um, okay. And we have had um, a huge movement of um, uh, new immigrants coming into Vermont, um, particularly in the Burlington area. So there's constant research that's been going on to learn about you know, the history of Vermont and the diversity of Vermont. And it goes back to that original story that I had told where I kind of had my aha moment. Right. That, you know, I think Vermont is also starting to realize that there are 
just story after story that have not been incorporated into the historical narrative. And oftentimes those stories are related to people of color. Do and I think that over the next few years, we're going to start to uncover stories of African-Americans going back to the 18th century that I think were often just kind of ignored or forgotten or written off because Vermont has always been you know, a very small populace when it comes right. to African-Americans. And so those stories weren't incorporated into the narrative. And we're right. realizing what a mistake that has been because yeah. it doesn't tell us the full story of the state. So eventually I think we're going to start to, to have more of these histories that we're gonna be able to tell. But you did say Frederick Douglass came to Vermont. He did visit Vermont. Frederick Douglass did a tour of New England um, where he was talking about his story and the anti-slavery movement. And Vermont was one of the stops that he did make. Um, and he was invited through the Anti-Slavery Society of Vermont. And okay. he made speeches. You can follow his kind of trail in the newspapers. And he was in Middlebury and Ferrisburg. And I think going back to your question of, you know, how did African Americans feel whenever they arrived in Vermont? Right. When Frederick Douglass was in Middlebury, he did not get a warm reception. He was booed. He was not treated well. Oh, really? Uh, so, but when he gets to Ferrisburg and he's received much more warmly because he's being met by the Anti-Slavery Society, by individuals who were, you know, working with him and many other abolitionists in the country. But he did not receive the warmest welcome when he arrived in Vermont. Oh, okay. All of the cities he went to. All right. Well, as we come to a close, um, what's the the hours for the museum and how the website again? Can you give us that so and how we can come and 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 and, and, and do Vermont? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So our website is rofi.org, and we're open May through October, seven days a week from. Uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Okay. And during the winter, I am in the office pretty much five days a week. So we do by appointment. So if people want to come, you know, November through March, um, just send an email. My email is director at rofi.org. And I'm always happy to show people around the museum, let them in to learn okay. a little bit about the history of the Robinsons and the Underground Railroad in Vermont. Okay. I, I thank you so very much for uh, coming on Strong Inspirations. Uh, everybody, this is what I do. I tell you, I find these people. <laughs> I found somebody in Vermont that's going to tell us some Black history in Vermont. And it's good stories. It's good stories of, of, of strong people in Vermont and not just African Americans, but others who are helping uh, with the cause coming out of Vermont. So uh, everybody, come on, hit the subscribe button like this video because i know you didn't know <laughs> you, you didn't know because uh, i didn't know uh tell somebody uh, about strong inspirations and to you my guests i say with all sincerity thank you for being on the show but also i want you to stay strong stay safe stay on your grind because we love what you're doing and educating the people and keeping the playing field level so that we don't forget that part of the history and so with that, we say have a great day and bye-bye, we out. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.